This is going to be a study on the subject of words that end in I-O-N. These words can give a Christian assurance of salvation. I believe the reason many people doubt their salvation is because they don't know any of the doctrines of salvation. These great words in the Bible that end in I-O-N and T-I-O-N, words like justification, redemption, adoption, sanctification, and imputation, they sound like big words, but they're not hard to understand. The majority of what preachers preach today is on salvation, but they just don't get into explaining what all of this stuff is that has to do with salvation. Christians today get a lot of preaching, but not much doctrine, so they don't know much, and they don't know what to do when they doubt their salvation. They don't know what verses to go to. They don't know all these great words from the Bible, and that's why they doubt. People who are relying on their own goodness to save themselves don't understand the doctrine of justification. To justify means to declare righteous. No man is righteous, as the Bible says in Romans 3.10. There is none righteous, no, not one. The Bible is clear that we can't be saved by our own righteousness. Titus 3.5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. God doesn't want anyone to go to hell, but God is holy and just. He can't let a wicked sinner go to heaven because that wouldn't be just for God to be a just judge he has to justify the righteous and condemn the wicked Deuteronomy 25 1 says if there be a controversy between men and they come into judgment that the judges may judge them then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked the same God who cannot lie said in Exodus 23, 7, Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. So God can't justify the wicked. But the Bible also says in Ezekiel 33, 11, Say unto them, As I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? God doesn't want a lost man to die in his sins. This is why God revealed himself in the flesh and lived a sinless life and died on the cross to pay for your sins. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God had to come down as Jesus Christ, the Son of God, God in the flesh, and live a perfect life to gain righteousness and be the perfect sacrifice for sin. God now offers this righteousness to, to anyone who will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, putting their trust on Him and Him alone for salvation. If a man does this, then that man will be accounted righteous before God. You put on the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and then God sees the man as perfect. Romans 4, 3 through 5 says, For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Abraham believed what God said, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Romans 4, 5 says, If a man believes on him, that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Since you can't work for righteousness and earn it yourself, God worked for it and earned it for you. It is God's righteousness. People who are trying to work their way to heaven are ignorant of God's righteousness and are trying to establish their own righteousness. Romans 10.3 For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ earned this righteousness for us when he lived a perfect life as a perfect man and died the perfect death, shedding his blood for all of us. Romans 10.4 says For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. In the Old Testament, 
God would forgive and remit sin. Exodus 34, 7, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And that will by no means clear the guilty. But their sins were not cleared until Jesus Christ shed his blood. This is why the Old Testament saints went to Abraham's bosom instead of the third heaven. A lot of non-dispensationalist teachers will try to get rid of Abraham's bosom because they want you to believe the Old Testament saints were saved exactly the same way as we are in the church age. I guess they finally realized that if people in the Old Testament were saved exactly the same way as we are now, then why didn't they go to the same place when they died? So they get rid of Abraham's bosom. By doing this, they put Abraham, Lazarus, and other Old Testament saints in the third heaven in Luke 16, and they put Jesus Christ burning in hell, which he didn't. Nowhere does it say he suffered in hell. To be saved, you simply come to Jesus Christ as the guilty sinner that you are. You quit trying to be justified by your own self-righteousness and realize your righteousness isn't worth filthy rags. And you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Then God imputes to you the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You are then declared righteous. Acts 13, 38, and 39, Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Justification happens when a man quits relying on his own self-righteousness and puts his trust in the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. You put your trust in that when you believed on him. When you get saved, God takes away your sinful account and give you, gives you Jesus Christ's righteous account. This is imputed righteousness. God imputes Jesus Christ's righteousness to you, meaning he charged it to your account. God puts your sins on Jesus Christ, and that is why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So you are saved by believing. You aren't saved by quitting a certain sin and then believing after that. You are saved by believing. The Bible says you are saved by believing in Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. And then Romans 3, 4. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans three twenty six to, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. Titus 3, 7, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Romans 5, 9, much more then being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So when God justifies... He declares you righteous. You are declared righteous when you trust in the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. You trusted in the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ when you relied on Him and His finished work on the cross to pay for your sins. So if God took your unrighteousness and gave you Jesus Christ's righteousness, then how could you lose your salvation? You have been declared righteous and God has given you the gift of Jesus Christ's righteousness. Now let's look at the next word, regeneration. Regeneration is the conversion of the sinner to something other than what he was. When a man believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, he is regenerated. He becomes a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Galatians 6.15 for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Titus 3, 5, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. When you are born again, you are regenerated, and this is what puts you into the family of God. John 3, 3 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
John 3, 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. The regeneration is a rebirth. You are born a second time. You got by the first time. You were born the first time when you came out of your mother's womb. And then the second time when you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the new birth. Regeneration is the creation by the Holy Spirit of a new man put inside the old man. And he is called the new man. The birth takes place the moment you believe. If you were born twice... You die once, but if you're born once, you die twice. You have to be born again if you don't want to see the second death. My first birth was in 1988. My second birth was in 2010. When you are regenerated, you are quickened. Ephesians 2.1 says, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. The new birth takes place from death to life. It takes you from death to life. You were born the first time physically, and this was a water birth, which had nothing to do with baptism. You get born the second time spiritually when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. John 1.12 says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. John 1.13, Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The new man that is placed inside you by the Holy Spirit does not commit sin, but the old man still sins. You still have the same sinful flesh as you did before you were saved, but the new man doesn't sin. And this is where the holiness crowd gets all messed up because they don't understand the concept of the two natures of the believer. They'll go to 1 John 3, 9 and say, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. So they say, if you sinned, then you aren't really saved. But 1 John 3, 9 is referring to the new man. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. If you are born again, then you know God. And you have a love that lost people don't have. 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and every one that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. 1 John 5, 1, Whosoever, that, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that beget loveth him also that is begotten of him. 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. If you, have been, if you have been regenerated, you love God, you love God's words, and love God's people. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God, as it says in John 8, 47. So if you have been regenerated by the way of the new birth, then how could you lose your salvation? Can you get unborn again? Does that even make sense? Your spirit has been born again, and you can't lose your salvation. The next word we will look at is adoption. When you are born again, the adoption is what puts you into the family of God. The adoption is a change in your position. You are taken out of the world and the devil's family and placed into the family of God as a son of God. This is why the devil hates soul winners because every time you lead a person to Jesus Christ, you are kidnapping one of his children. In regeneration, the Bible the believer becomes a child of God. In adoption, the child receives the position of an adult son. Galatians 4, 5, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Ephesians 1, 5, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, having according to the good pleasure of his will. Romans 8, 15, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Before you were saved, you were not in the family of God. All of these people going around saying, everyone is a child of God, are completely wrong. Ephesians 2.12 says that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. You are adopted and become a part of God's family only by faith. Galatians 3.26, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. If you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are a 
Son of God. 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And your adoption will be complete at the rapture. Romans 8, 23, And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. You don't have to worry about this sinful flesh anymore. When you get your glorified body that is just like Jesus Christ's body. And God now loves you like he loves Jesus Christ. This is different than his love for a lost man. John 3.16 says God so loved the world past tense. But if you're saved then God presently loves you as much as he does Jesus Christ. John 17.23 I and them and thou and me that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. And as a son of God you inherit some things. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who were kept by the power of God, through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Notice it said the inheritance was incorruptible, undefiled, and fadeth not away, and reserved in heaven for you. That even says, it even says you were kept by the power of God through faith. Do you still think you can lose your salvation? If you are saved, then God chose you for his child. You weren't chosen until you got in Christ, Ephesians 1, 4, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. You chose to get in Christ by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and you are chosen by God the moment you got in Jesus Christ. You had a free will in the matter, but you're not chosen until you got in. If you didn't get in, you wouldn't be chosen. In regeneration, your nature was changed. In justification, your standing was changed. In adoption, your position was changed. And now we will look at sanctification where your character is changed. The meaning of sanctification is set apart. Psalms 4.3 says, But know that the Lord hath set apart him that is godly for himself. The Lord will hear when I call unto him. There are three parts to sanctification. Past present and future tense every born again believer was sanctified the moment he believed on the lord jesus christ first corinthians 6 to 6 11 says and such were some of you but ye are washed but ye are sanctified but ye are justified in the name of the lord jesus and by the spirit of our god hebrews 10 and verse 10 by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of jesus christ once for all so you are sanctified the moment you believe on the Lord Jesus. And then you have sanctification in the present tense. A day-by-day -day thing where you live holy and separate lives. This part doesn't make you saved or unsaved. But if you don't live holy and separate lives, then you will end up feeling like you aren't saved. A believer should want to live a holy, sanctified life because Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. We should want to please Him. 2 Timothy 2.21 says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the Master's use, and prepared unto every good work. And you are sanctified through the words of God. John 17.17 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Psalms 119.9 Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. You cleanse your way by reading the Bible. God tells you how to live and how to be set apart or sanctified through his book. Being separate from the world and separated to the gospel and the work of God doesn't make you any more saved, but it will give you assurance. If you're saved and not separate, and set apart for God, then you will end up doubting your salvation. You will eventually say, a saved person won't do what I'm doing. I can't be saved. Many people think they are living a sanctified life if they aren't drinking, fornicating, smoking, or doing drugs. But they forget about gossiping, lying, worrying, complaining, foolish thoughts, watching movies they shouldn't watch, 
TV shows they shouldn't watch, putting stuff on Facebook they shouldn't put up that's ruining their testimony. Just because you go to church on Sunday and dress up and tithe, that doesn't mean you're living a sanctified life. When you read the words of God, you find out that even things like gossiping, lying, worrying, complaining are sins, and it's just not drinking and shacking up with someone that's a sin. But sanctification is also by the blood. Hebrews 13, 12 says, Wherefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered without the gate. The words of God reveals that we are sinful creatures, and that even just the thought of foolishness is sin. And then the blood cleanses us as well you are sanctified by God the Son he, uh, Ephesians 5 26 that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy and without blemish you are sanctified by the Holy Spirit, 2 Thessalonians 2.13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. We are also sanctified by chastisement. Since you are adopted, then God treats you as a son, and he, he chastises you. Hebrews 12.7-8 through 8, If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof are all our partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. If the other things don't keep you straight, getting chastised will. When a Christian stays in sin without confessing it, then God is going to chastise them. This is done in love, and God does this to whip you back in line. Many don't believe you can apply this to the church age we are in now, but I believe it applies to us. We are sanctified when we yield to God. Romans 6.19 says, I speak after, after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For you, as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity, and to iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. You have a part in your daily sanctification. The future tense of sanctification will happen at the rapture where God changes our vile body and fashions it like unto his glorious body. We will be like him. We will put off this sinful flesh and get a body that cannot sin and we will be completely holy. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is our predestination. Predestination doesn't have anything to do with your salvation. You weren't predestinated until you were saved. Romans 8.29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. You weren't predestinated until you got in Christ. And your final destination is to be conformed to the image of his Son. But that isn't your destination unless you get in Christ. God chose to choose every person that chose of his own free will to get in Christ. We were sanctified in the past when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are sanctified daily by reading the words of God and staying in fellowship, praying, confessing our sins, and yielding our members to be servants to righteousness. And then we are sanctified in the future tense when we get our glorified body. Your eternal destination doesn't depend on what you do each day, but what you did in the past. And if you did what God said, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, then your destination is fixed. When you did that, you were saved from the penalty of sin, which is hell. When you live a separate holy life day by day, then you are saved from the power of sin. But it doesn't make you any more saved in the sense of going to heaven or hell. Then when Jesus Christ comes back to catch you away, you are delivered from the presence of sin because you have a perfect and sinless body. So this is sanctification. But what about the spiritual circumcision? Colossians 2.11 says, In whom also ye are sanctified with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ.
When you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, your soul was cut loose from your flesh. So now when you sin after salvation, it isn't applied to your soul like it was before you were saved. This should give you assurance that even when you sin and mess up, you don't have to get reborn again as the holiness preachers teach. Confess your sins to stay in fellowship, not to keep your relationship. Your relationship to God is a son of God, and the relationship doesn't change after you are saved. And what about propitiation? This means to appease wrath. Jesus Christ took our place on the cross and became sin for us. When he did this, he appeased God's wrath against us. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. If you, if you want the wrath of God off of you, then you have to believe on the Savior that took our place. Romans 3.25 says, Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through the faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. 1 John 2, 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 1 John 14, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Notice it said he is the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. That would include the sins of sodomites and even pedophiles or any other sex perv or adulterer or drunk or any other person who is wicked. Any man can come to Jesus Christ and be saved. Hebrews 9.27 says, And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. You're going to die one day and your soul will go to heaven or hell. If God let his son die on the cross for your sins, then he will definitely let you burn in hell for rejecting his son. God is offering the free gift of salvation to you if, we, if you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 4, and 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. If you want to be saved, you simply come to Jesus Christ as a guilty sinner and believe on him and him alone to save you and quit relying on your own self-righteousness and instead rely on Jesus Christ's righteousness. Rely on him and him alone and his finished work on the cross. If you believe on him, then you will be saved and have eternal life.